Your Leadership Moment Democratizing Leadership in an Age of Authoritarianism by Eric R. Martin Narrated by Greg Balia For the Unseen Start Close In by David White Start close in. Don't take the second step or the third. Start with the first thing close in, the step you don't want to take. Start with the ground you know, the pale ground beneath your feet, your own way to begin the conversation. Start with your own question. Give up on other people's questions. Don't let them smother something simple. To hear another's voice, follow your own voice. Wait until that voice becomes an intimate private ear that can really listen to another. Start right now. Take a small step you can call your own. Don't follow someone else's heroics. Be humble and focused. Start close in. Don't mistake that other for your own. Start close in. Don't take the second step or the third. Start with the first thing close in. The step you don't want to take. Introduction Standing in the Heat We hope for better things. It will arise from the ashes. Motto of the City of Detroit, 1805 Some houses are known as firefighter killers. Dilapidated interior staircases and door frames, weakened from years of neglect or vacancy, combine with the brick exterior distinctive of homes from Detroit's Gilded Age to create unpredictable oven-like conditions. A firefighter from my old neighborhood once told me about his narrow escape from one of these killers. The campfire flames we were huddled around flickered across his face, reaching up to light the fresh cigarette dangling beneath his mustache. I was new to the job, he began. One of my first runs, fires. A single family home. I was charging down the hallway, pitch black, thick smoke everywhere, completely surrounded by fire. Suddenly, someone grabbed me from behind, yelling, Get out! Before I knew it, I was midair flying out the front of the house. I found myself lying on the muddy, tangled grass, puking up smoke. Now here's a story I haven't heard before. I thought to myself. If you've hung around firefighters much, you can recite from memory whole repertoires of their stories, replete with long pauses and emphatic hand gestures. Then I saw three more firefighters flying out the front door, he continued, the wrinkles around his eyes betraying a fondness firefighters often felt toward my dad. And behind them, Sergeant Martin, your dad, the fire still raging behind him, tossed us out one by one before the fire took us all. That's the day I learned what firefighting is all about. The real work of a firefighter is not just putting out fires. It is to serve and protect people from harm, including, sometimes, protecting their protectors. That fire was one of 300 in the city of Detroit that night, one of 800 that weekend, one of 22,000 that year. 1984, the year when Detroit earned distinction as the arson capital of the world. Some of the fires were indeed arsons, people burning for kicks or for insurance money or to clear abandoned property. But not all. Cold winters and poverty combined with ill-maintained electric heaters to create accidental fires. Though accidental is a misleading word. In fact, the fires were the natural, unfortunate result of economically destitute Detroiters trying to live as best they could behind boarded-up windows with no electricity, heat, or water, and only a fire pit to keep them warm. To this day, the old-timers say my dad, Roger Martin, was one of the best firefighters the city of Detroit ever knew. A legend. A leader. For his fellow firefighters, he provided everything people expect from their leaders. Show them where to go, into the fire or out, up to the roof or down to the basement. Give them a clear job to do. Keep them safe. And know your stuff. Only later did I learn that these things have little to do with leadership. 
I also knew very little back then of my father's reputation as a fist fighter, not just a firefighter, and as a drinker. My days were like those of every other kid growing up in the city. Wake up, walk to school, and stay out of trouble. On mornings when Dad arrived home from the firehouse, the city's decay wafted into my bedroom in the form of the sweet scent of fire truck diesel and smoke from the previous night's fires. It drew me half asleep and blurry-eyed toward the thoroughly spent but satisfied man seated at the kitchen table, coffee in hand, along with the day's newspaper and his trusted crossword puzzle book. I'd shuffle slowly toward his silhouette for my morning hug, backlit by the fiery sun rising through our kitchen window. I love you, I'd say, to which he always responded playfully, not as much as I love you. Other than the smoke and diesel, it's the stories I remember the most. Stories like the one I heard around that campfire. Stories that he and others told about raging routine fires and predictable near-death experiences. Stories about fellow firefighters, black, brown, and white, storming the blazing homes of Detroit's east side where I grew up. Setting aside Detroit's fiery racism, if only momentarily, they got the work done and stayed alive while doing it. Many of the stories were horrific, but they were always punctuated with laughter, the coping kind of laughter in the arsenal of every first responder, and with a strong sense of brotherhood. Detroit's motto, Spiramus Meliora, Resurgit Cineribus, translates to, We hope for better things. It shall arise from the ashes. It dates to 1805, when a great fire burned most of the city to the ground. Father Gabriel Richard, a French Roman Catholic priest, wrote these words in the hope that the city would rebuild. It reflected the spirit and resilience of the people, as well as a resolve that endures to this day. In the 215 years since, Detroit has undergone a tumultuous rise and decline. After peaking at the height of the auto industry in the 1960s, the city struggled with a shrinking population, dwindling tax base, and ultimately, bankruptcy. But Detroit was broken long before it went broke. It had been broken my whole life, a reality I was born into, learned to lament, but seldom questioned. It was a city with rising tensions between white residents and black residents, who were often blamed for the arsons. Generations of redlining and racial hostility poisoned the city's well of progress. Riots, white flight, industry collapse, corruption, crime. We had it all. Walking to and from school every day, I occasionally took note of street after street of unfolding neighborhood decay. Liquor stores sold alcohol to children, drug addicts, and prostitutes alike. Kids with nobody to watch them at home frequented fast food joints bent on cultivating deadly lifelong eating habits. Houses stood abandoned on every block, including, eventually, my own house. At one point, over 50,000 buildings stood vacant, about one out of every five buildings in the city. These vacant buildings, unwatched and unsecured, bred crime, vice, and devastating fires. The reason we put out fires, I've heard firefighters say, is you're two feet away from someone's whole life. Firefighters see themselves as being on the front lines with every blaze. If they don't stop it, an entire street might burn. Yet the fires kept burning, day after day, year after year, until it just became a way of life that few of us questioned. Left unaddressed, ignored, or denied, the underlying causes of the fires stole the lives, livelihoods, and sense of dignity from all of us. It's funny how a place can go south right before your eyes, but you just don't see it. Not until I moved away, far away from Detroit, could I apprehend how far the city had fallen over the course of my lifetime. The descent was so gradual, it was easy to miss. It was also easy to overlook the many false solutions that we white residents glommed onto to stymie the decay. Politicians who promised to get tough on crime. Neighbors who quietly pressured each other not to sell their homes to the blacks, even as housing prices tanked, denial that somehow our own racism was part of the problem. 
There was also plain old, it's not my problem, apathy.